All right, hello everyone. This is Pastor Gabe. Welcome to Soapbox Theology. We're continuing our walk through 1 John, and we're still in chapter 2. Today we're going to be looking at 18 through 25. So let me let me begin reading the text here. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not all of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. So this section is about the Antichrist. And not just the Antichrist. Actually, it's more about Antichrist, anti-Christian or Antichrist um, sentiment in general than discussing a specific Antichrist figure. Uh, he says that there are many. So again, he's talking to the children here. Remember, he had just, in the last section, he said, I'm writing to you fathers, I'm writing to you young men, I'm writing to you children. But I think here he's calling them all in general children in, in the sense that he's a father in the faith. It is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. So he's distinguishing there is, in a, in a, in a sense, one figure who will fulfill this role of Antichrist, uh, penultimately, I guess, if you want to say. But many uh, um, Antichrists have come. So there's been many figures, many men who have stood in this, in this particular office, in this particular role, who will and have denied... Uh, who have denied Christ. And he says, therefore, we know that this is the last hour. So let's just talk about this idea of the last hour for the moment. It doesn't mean, it's not as if when John was writing in the first century, that he's talking about these are the very final days of earth. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the last hour in the sense of the church age. And so let me just pick up a couple texts to point this out. Uh, over in 1 Peter 20, he, speaking of Christ, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was being manifest in the last times for the sake of you. So the last time involves the times when Jesus was made manifest, when he was made manifest in the flesh. So it's, it's talking about the church age, the time when Christ has come. Let me read another one. This is from Hebrews, Hebrews 1. Long ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, who through, through whom also he created the world. So again, in these last days, these final days, these final time, I mean, we certainly are in the final uh, moment of history in that we're in the church age. We're in the age that now is spreading the gospel, anticipating the return of Christ. So the church age is considered the last days. It doesn't mean, it's not saying for the last 2,000 years, uh, <clears throat> we are in the final you know, uh, few days of, of, of history. It's saying that this time from the first coming between the between the first and second coming are considered the last days. These are this is the last time. This is the this is the amount of time that we have to share the gospel to spread the truth, and so we need to take that call very seriously. But the, the, these are the last days, and we are in them now, and so we need to be we need to be aware of this. First Timothy says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. We've seen lots of people apostatize, quote unquote, deconstruct their apostatizing. Second Timothy 3.15, also in Second Timothy, says, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, uh, irreconcilable, uh, malicious, gossips, without self-control, bullet brutal haters of men. We're seeing all of this now, okay? There's no reason to say that we're not in the last times because a lot of this stuff is happening, and again, the last times is referring to the, the church age, the, the age that we're in now. So going back to the text, it's the last hour, it's the last days, Antichrist is coming, and many Antichrists have come. Those who 
those who deny that he is the Christ. Okay. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all they are all not of us. And this is important because Antichrist specifically is saying we take a position on the Christ. We take a position on the Christ just means the, the Messiah, the anointed one. And so they're specifically saying we're taking a position on, on Christ and Jesus therefore is not the Messiah. That's what Antichrist sentiment is. So we need to understand many world religions take, uh, take this view. Uh, Muslims say that he's not the uh, not the Messiah in in the way that the Messiah is revealed to us in the new in in, in the in the scriptures that he's the Son of God as we see from Psalm two, Proverbs thirty, four. Um, the idea that God's Son is the Messiah that's what Psalm two is all about. God has installed His own anointed one on the throne. That's where He laughs at the na nations who are raging against Him. So it's a denial that not just that like it, it, it's it's in a sense acknowledging that Jesus. Uh, it's kind of the, the quandary that C.S. Lewis put forward. He's liar, lunatic, Lord, right? When they're denying he's, he's Lord, they're, they're calling him many other things. Some people will say, well, he's just a good teacher. Or some might even say, you know, he had a role to fill, fulfill in Jewish history, but he wasn't the Messiah, in fact. So, you, so there's many groups that would deny, uh, that would fall into this category of Antichrist. You know, like Mormons deny that Jesus is, is actually God. Same with the Jehovah's Witness. He's denied, he's denied his role there. And, and in some sense, okay, and this might be offensive to some, the current today position of Judaism is Antichrist. Okay? That's not anti-Semitic or hating on them, but it is saying that they take up a position where they say Jesus is not the Messiah. That's Antichrist. It's denying Jesus his role, his who he was, who he actually was in history. And so what this means is that anyone who takes this position is not Christian, they're outside the pale, and they need to be uh, evangelized. They need to hear the truth because they don't have the truth. But for here, it's talking about antichrists um, referring to leaders in these positions. They are undermining the gospel, and they are viewed as, as, as enemies of the cross. And so they, because that's why it's saying they came out from us. And so a lot of these cults, this is why so many cults take positions on Jesus. It's like they want to incorporate him, but they're leaving behind the actual truth and the message of who Christ is is and this is saying that they went out from them specifically in the early days and many of, of these groups are, are aberrant teachings of christianity they break away and they redefine who christ is christ wasn't really uh christ wasn't really god they would say so there's a lot of aberrant communities like that and have that have these this false teaching but they went out from us that it would be plain that they are not of us i mean think of the parable of the sower from uh, matthew 13 it's very clear in that parable that when the when the when the sower goes out to sow the seed, it hits the different kinds of grounds, and only one of the four bears fruit. One totally rejects it, but two of two of the four, for a season, look the part. Right, though that hits the thorny ground, and the uh, the hard ground, the rocky ground. It says for a season they kind of sprout, they kind of rise up very quickly, but they have no root. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of sin, draw them away. And so we understand this even from the parables of Christ of Jesus, that there are those who looked like they were with us for a time, but the time comes when they go out from us and it becomes plain that they were not of us. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats. So, and that's who uh, these Antichrist figures come from, because they often are holding on to, uh, let's say, a dimension of Christianity, but denying its power. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, again, Christ, the anointed one, and you all have knowledge. So again, part of the, the point that it's saying is the those that take up this position of antichrist are without knowledge. They're rejecting the knowledge of Christ. They're rejecting the knowledge of the word of God. They're rejecting the truth. And then so 21, he says, I'm right to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lies of the truth. So he's saying, you have the truth. Be aware that you have the truth. And then be, so then be aware that there's going to come along lies. Be aware that these things are going to come along and that perhaps they'll tempt you, perhaps they'll challenge, challenge you, but stick to the truth because you know it. Uh, <clears throat> no lies of the truth. In, in other words, Antichrist is a position that's lying. It's lying about who God is. It's lying about who the Messiah is. It's lying about who Jesus is. Verse 22, he was the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. So again, 
to say that Jesus might be all of these other things, but he's not the Messiah, he's not the promised anointed one that's seen throughout the Old Testament. He's not the son of man who approaches the Ancient of Days from Daniel 7, let's say, and God shares his glory with him, shares his rule, his dominion with him. Who is this figure? Okay, to deny that it's Christ is, is Antichrist. So no one... <clears throat> Uh, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. So again, a lot of people say, well, they want God, but they're not interested in Christ. Or uh, even today, people are saying, well, I'm interested in Jesus, but I don't want, don't want the God of the Old Testament. He's all wrathful, and I, I prefer the loving side, as if you can just pick or choose one or the other. And so this is saying they come hand in hand. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. So... If you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. So a lot of, you know, like, for instance, um, Islam says that they're worshiping the same God of Abraham. If you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. Uh, that's just the way it is. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So if you actually really want the Father, if you really want God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Old Testament, you need the Son. You need the Son also. So you confess the Son, you get the Father. You deny the Son, you don't get the Father. And that's, that's what the essence of Antichrist is. So this is not so much talking about who it is, but it's talking about the Spirit and how it is coming into the world in these last days. In this final time, during the Church Age, many Antichrists will rise up, and this is where we get so many false religions. So then he repeats kind of his theme that he's been looking at this whole time. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And again, that word abide means remain, to make your house within, to, uh, <clears throat> to stay with this truth, to make it your home. And again, he said, what did you hear from the beginning? Go back to chapter 1 as he began. He says, that which was heard from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So he's saying, our testimony about Jesus is what we have been telling you from the, from the beginning. We've been telling you this all along. So when you hear these lies, when you hear these antichrist sentiments, what are you to do? Go back to the beginning. Go back to the original gospel. Go back to the original testimony, the original witness. Go back to the original witnesses, for example, the apostles. And they're going to point you to who Christ is. Because over time, in the last days, you're going to start hearing different messages. Different messages that deny the Father, that deny the Son. And still want to pay him lip service, but are ultimately undermining what the truth of the scripture is. So, again, go back to the beginning. <laughs> Find that solid ground. Stay there. Even when the shifting sand comes. Even when the false teachers arise. And if you remain in him, uh, then you too will remain in the Son and the Father. So if, if you remain in the teaching, if you remain in the testimony, if you remain in the witness of Scripture, then what it was in the beginning will remain in you. Okay, The message will remain in you, and then you will remain with the Son and the Father. So it's a, it's a really great uh, promise here that God will be faithful to his word, he will be faithful to his message, and he will be faithful to his people that are faithful to those things. And then we get the Son as well. And then 25, and this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. So we hold to the Father, we hold to the Son, we hold to the teaching, we hold to the witness, we hold to the testimony, we hold to the confession, and in that we will ultimately see eternal life. We will ultimately see those promises that he made to us realized in the eschaton, in, in, in eternity. So this is a warning. You're my children. I'm your father. I'm your spiritual father figure. He's saying, hold on to this truth. Hold on to the confession. Hebrews, in, in the book of Hebrews, at one point, where he's called the high priest of our confession. What is your confession about Christ? Who is he really? What are you holding on to? What are you banking on? What are you remaining in? Are you remaining in the teaching or not? If you do, you will have the Father, you will have the Son, you will have the consistent testimony, and you will see eternal life. So avoid the teachings of the Antichrist. Avoid teachings that deny that Jesus is the Messiah. Avoid teachings that deny that Jesus is the Son. Avoid teachings that create a hierarchy where Jesus is subordinate to the Father and he's not, he's not, not quite as great as he, and he's, he's, he's like... A creature? No. 
this is getting to the idea of the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and the Spirit are God. And there are three persons, Father, Son, and the Spirit, and they're all co-eternal, -co equally God. But, um, but there's three different persons, one God. The minute you try to take that apart and redefine it, you're getting into this area of becoming Antichrist because you're denying who Christ is. You're denying who Jesus is. You're denying the testimony that the Word of God has given us. But, again, his reminder in verse 20, But you have the anointed one of the Holy One. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. If you have the Spirit of God inside you abiding, then you're going to abide in the truth. And so that's why we need to make sure. And remember, his whole argument up to this point has been if you're walking in the light, right? If you're loving your brother, if you're not hating them, if you're if 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 you're if you're walking a consistent life of faith, then you're going to have the Holy Spirit continuing to bear witness to this truth. But if you're starting to get out of line, if you're starting to to waver, then you're in danger. And so be and be careful. And it's not just being danger of being wrong. It could be in danger of crossing over to this anti-Christian, anti-Christ view of the world. Don't do that. It's the last hour. It's the church age. Hold on until he returns. So that's uh, more of First John chapter two, and I think we'll finish up First uh, John chapter two next time. But uh, so be, beware. Abide in Christ. Honor Christ. Don't do not denigrate him in any way at all, and uh, hold to him and see eternal life. So thank you guys so much. We'll look at more next time.